John Douglas. Hey, congratulations for Unwelcome. This is one of those guilty pleasure movies that a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, how, do you John, pronounce, how do you pronounce your name? Is it Gig? Gig. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. Right. So, so John, let's start with you first. Where the original idea came from for Unwelcome? Well, it started as a conversation I was having with my uh, writer, Mark Stay, and we were laughing at each other, really. We were sort of reminiscing about all the times where we'd been in violent confrontations and we'd been absolutely terrified and how useless we were at fighting and how we would describe ourselves to people as pacifists, which we thought really was, if we were being honest, was a kind of glorified way of saying coward, just a, nice, a nicer way of putting it. Um, but when we, the more we got to talk about it, we started realizing that if our kids were involved, that we would actually be violent. We, I have a 13 year old son and he has a couple of teenage kids. And we thought if their lives were threatened, that we would, we would be violent, we'd have to be violent. And not only would we be violent, but probably because we are such useless fighters, we'd probably grab a weapon as opposed to using our fists. And we'd probably go over the top in the efforts to get the thing finished, you know. So we'd probably be ridiculously ultra-violent as opposed to, you know, somebody who could box or karate fight or something like that. And that just seemed like an interesting paradox. We just thought, how can it be that two pacifists could be this violent? And we thought, okay, that's that feels like a dramatic question. That feels like something you should ask a couple of characters. So that's where Doug's character and Hannah's character come in. And these two very liberal metropolitan Londoners who would definitely at the beginning of the film in the first minute would describe themselves as pacifists maybe not about five minutes in but one minute in they certainly would <laughs> Doug, Douglas uh, for, for yourself what initially drew you uh to uh to this film and um and I haven't ever seen you play a character like Jamie before Okay. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I, I, it was a character that I hadn't played before. I hadn't done a movie. I hadn't done a horror film before. Um, so it was a whole world that I'd never explored. I, I, I loved the fantasy element. I loved the, I loved the idea of the red caps. I loved the idea of the folklore. Um, I loved the way that the filmmakers um, wanted to bring the red caps to life, uh, and the way they, the way they wanted to animate them and use real actors and some motion capture. Um, so I just, I enjoyed the whole package. And then I, and I, and I kind of liked the, the challenge of the idea of, of playing Jamie, this guy who is a bit useless, but how, how to, to play him, but keep the audience on your side and make sure they stick with him on this, on this journey. And they don't sort of give up on him. And they're like, why are we watching this guy? You know, they, uh, they had to still care about him and, and Maya as a unit. So yeah, that's why. <laughs> John, tell tell us about the approach of using um, both practical and CGI into a production like this. Yeah, well, I was very influenced by an old Stephen King adaptation called Cat Side. I don't know if you remember that film, where there's a it's a three part film, but the third part is Drew Barrymore is in a bedroom and this little goblin comes through the skirting board and breaks into her, into her bedroom and tries to steal her breath. Um, and the way they did this goblin was they had a little, um, they had giant sets and they had a full-size actor, an adult actor, um, in a costume, walking about on these giant sets and he climbs and clambers onto a huge roller skate and things like that. Uh, and that's always stayed with me ever since I saw it as a kid. And so we used a similar approach in this film. We built giant sets. so. When the when you see the goblin and he comes through, he, he appears. Uh, you get to look at him properly, and he comes through the French doors at the back of the living room. And um, those French doors are twelve feet high, and that actor really is reaching up to get hold of that giant door handle that we built. And we built double height sets for everything. So every time you see a set with a goblin in it, there was a version which was twice as big, just round the corner from the main set where Doug and Hannah would be acting. Um, but we also married that up with um, very modern techniques in that when we, the actors had these fantastic static goblin masks um, and in close up, obviously the, the mask didn't move at all. So we 
shot a performance with an actor, an old friend of mine called Rick Warden, who played all of the goblins. He played their faces and their voices. And he had lots of little dots on his face and we motion captured his performance and then chose the bits we liked and gave them to the visual effects department. And they animated the faces uh, following the performance very closely. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds, you know, because the CG guys could see the masks and when they animated their version of the masks and put them back over, there was a very clear reference. So I think what you end up with is something that's extremely realistic. And they, when the goblins are moving around and you get to look at them in the wide, you can see that they've got gravity, that they're actually walking on the things that they're walking on and touching the things that they're touching, um, which gives it a kind of, uh, you know, a magical illusion, I suppose. And a lot of people who've seen the film can't really work out how it was done. And they, they, a lot of people think it's puppetry, you know. That's how we got the goblins into the into the shots with the actors. And they've, you know, there's a lot of talk about Jim Henson and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I would defy anybody to get the a puppet to be as expressive with its face as, as our goblins are, you know. <laughs> well, initially I thought it was puppetry too, but uh, yeah. um, D Douglas, throwing it to, to you, because this is not your first go around, you know, dealing with this type of a production, you know, with the, you know, CGI and fantastical sets and, and, and so on. Is this something that you're now used to and do, and do you love um, using your imagination in this case? I think as an actor, you will always try, you would always prefer to be in the real place with the real people or things or animals or whatever it is, because it it's it's hard to it's hard to replicate that. But yeah, I have I have had now experience of working on these big productions, which has green screen and and stuff like that. But I think what was unique about this film, it, it never quite felt like that. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I've made movies like Jupiter Ascending where everything's on a group, massive green screen and you know, Mila Kunis is walking towards you and you're having to imagine like doors opening and you're like, having to like, how do you play like a door? Like she's not, she's standing in front of you, but I have to pretend I can't see her and doors open and I see her. I mean, it, they add it all. No, we're going to add the doors in post. I mean, that's hard. Like that's hard, not seeing someone and then seeing someone behind a door. Uh, but this, because we had all of these puppets on, on set, uh, not puppets. Sorry, we had all the, act the the actors on set with their masks on the B unit shooting a lot of the on these bigger sets. I could go across and imagine it and see it, and then just in my head place it exactly where we where we were. So I think that was a uh, that's a credit to the to the, the 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 what did you call them, John? The creature, the um, the prosthetics. What, what creature maker? What do you, what, what do you call it? What do you yeah, call you it? Do, yeah pr uh, prosthetic designer or, yeah. Prosthetic yeah. designer. The credit to the prosthetic designer and the production designers and John himself for making sure we understood the world that we were in. We also had, we had little um, life-size goblin maquettes, you know, which weren't intended to be used for anything, really. We just had these little guys, you know, and they had the correct masks and everything just shrunk down to half size, which is actually the, the real size. So that sometimes they were quite useful. You could, you know, you could put the put a gob put a little goblin on the bed for people to look at or whatever we needed we needed uh, to do. And they they were amazing. The detail they, I mean, they were works of art. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, who this has film... those? Where are they? <laughs> I don't know. Are they in your bedroom or no? no you can not. have them on I don't the know. I don't know on where your they sideboard. Are. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well this this movie is uh scary and and, and i would uh you know not not have the thought to uh, visit ireland with all their irish folk folklore and creatures over there but uh john douglas thank you very much uh for having this talk uh with us about uh, unwelcome and hopefully we get to do this again thank you take care thanks for your support okay, thank you